Hi, everyone. Thanks, Furman. Thanks very much for inviting me to do this quite scary thing. Um, really, um, I feel like to do an intellectual biography, one um, would have been best to have written a PhD. So I feel like I've sort of crammed a whole lot of stuff together in about a week. Can I click that? Here we go. Um, it's also intimidating to be here with um, Sean and James, two architects who I greatly admire. So anyway, here we go. I suppose I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about my work or our work. I've just been trying to do it and just make each project a little bit better than the last one we did. For a talk, I would really much rather hide behind the buildings. I think most architects feel like that. Anyway, here we go. So, growing up, this is, I don't need to look there, I can see it right here. This is, this is the house, this is the house I grew up in. My parents still live there today. It was really a very happy, quiet, kind of standard Melbourne suburban childhood. And in many ways, the fact that mum and dad are still there today, this has contributed to my idea as home um, as being something permanent, not real estate. Forever houses. Not only did we live in the same house, we went on the same holidays every year. Queensland, fishing, my aunt and uncle's farm in central New South Wales. It's my sister and I. We spent a lot of time outdoors, um, and if we weren't doing that, it was a lot of sport. And really, um, I don't remember a lot of culture or a lot of conversation about art or architecture. So in many ways, this has sort of contributed to my sense that architecture is something that happens in the background to life. It supports it um, and, and um, looks after us, but it's not ever sort of foregrounded, and it certainly was never discussed as an intellectual endeavour. There's my mum with my brother and I when we were little. Starting with my mum, incredibly sort of um, social, um, the best organiser I know. Um, and mum, I suppose, growing up in Cairns, she um, made the most of limited resources. She's an excellent clothes maker. And so in many ways, mum made all of our clothes. And that's really contributed to my sense that creative pursuits were something that you did um, for um, a practical purpose or a useful purpose. This is horrifying, but um, this is one of the outfits. I'm not sure if you can call it that practical. <laughs> or this one. But my mum made me that doll as well. And the tradition has continued for her grandkids and my children and their friends, making some more practical mermaid outfits. My dad's an engineer and comes from a family of engineers um, that started this company, Herger's, in Brisbane. They made these clocks. This is my dad rocking his best Queensland-style suit in China. He worked for Telstra for many years and ended up running large infrastructural projects throughout Australia and China. My dad... Um, it, incredibly pragmatic and rational, and really never shy about giving us his opinion on our life choices. When I told him I was going to study architecture, he told me that all the architects he knew were driving taxis. It was, it was just after the 1990s recession. In many ways, Dad was sort of suspicious of architects. I think he still is. Um, anyway, so I, I pushed on anyway. Um, Dad, I suppose at six foot four and never holding back on his opinion, we all had to grow a thick skin. But this empowered us. He also empowered us to challenge questions and to challenge him. And so in many ways, this has helped me um, stand up for myself um, on construction sites with large developers, and I'm not intimidated by dominating or domineering men. Sorry, Dad, I'm not talking about you. Dad did oil paint um, on the side of his day job, and I wonder if something in him creative wanted to come out. So I got into RMIT. I wasn't sure if it was what I wanted to do. 
but I got in anyway. And it was really a hugely influential time. The architecture school had just moved into Peter Corrigan's building, and soon after, ARM completed their story hall. These buildings, much celebrated buildings, um, really um, had a lot to say on Melbourne, on Melbourne culture, and really to say I sort of didn't understand them would be an understatement at the time. Um, it made me feel in many ways totally out of my depth in the degree and took a long time for me to sort of find my people. I worked very hard, um, I wasn't very good, never really good at making models. Leon van Skyck ran the tripolar model, and I suppose there was this idea that you could sort of find your path in that, and it did take me a long time. In second year, I, went on, I did a design studio that was more cross-disciplinary. We went to Lake Mungo, and it was sort of such a relief for me to um, start talking about conversations about site and place. We were lucky to have Cam Robbins as a guest tutor, and I loved his sort of site, beautiful site-specific artworks that seemed to capture something of a, of, a, of a place, unique about a place and weather. This trip inspired me to take a year out with my sister. And in many ways, rather than sort of going off to Europe, we went to Southeast Asia and drove around Australia searching for the desert. Spending a week in an underground house in Cooper Pedy. Coming back to RMIT, I suppose I started to feel more confidence to find my people. Sand Helsel was someone who really inspired me at the time. Sand taught me about rigorous site mapping and, and a design process that starts from one to one all the way up to the city scale. Nigel Bertram taught us about looking carefully at inner Melbourne city suburbs. Shane Murray, who taught me how to um, look at building typologies and cities as well. And Mel Dodd, helping us to remember about the people that we were designing for, communities, and doing good things. Diego Ramirez, I, I, you talked a lot about adaptable and flexible housing models. And Mauro Baracco, who kept us very late at night, but um, introduced me to Caesar. For my final year project, I went back to the desert. In many ways, it was a reaction against what I saw as the predominant RMIT culture of um, picking a sort of inner city cultural building and designing a big hero building, a big icon statement. I wanted to um, engage with the Australian landscape and um, think about something that might be more having a conversation about supportive, something supportive for people. I loved the indulgence of a pre-major semester, all the mapping and site analysis. And in the end, designed a roadhouse that was on one hand embedded in the ground, and on the other, a big roof floating above the landscape. I worked in many different places after I graduated. I, um, worked in Asia, Europe, the UK, and I ended up being back here working for Lab, for Peter Davidson and Don Bates. Not working on this building, um, but gee, it's nice to be here giving this talk today in one of my favourite Lab spaces. I worked really closely with Peter on their big um, China projects um, and was lucky to travel with Peter quite a bit. He taught me to care for absolutely every single millimetre. I think this is him pointing something out that I hadn't picked up. He was relentless in his pursuit of making things exactly right at all scales. On the side, I, I ran design studios at RMIT sort of over the years. And in many ways, that allowed me to um, explore my interests in architecture, landscape, sort of the everyday, and thinking about density and green space, and how we might increase the density of our cities, but not lose the green space. Starting from the smallest element, 
So a lot of the design studios, I suppose, um, came from some of my earlier influences. Some favourites that I've pulled out, you know, land art. I love, I've always loved these projects for their, um, how they sort of reveal something about a site, about being specific to a site. Joyful and rigorous at the same time. That's too close. <laughs> And again, revealing something that maybe you didn't initially quite see. I always loved this West 8 project that um, reuses waste products from a site to, to make an inf you know, in infrastructural scale intervention. Or James Corner's mapping drawings, beautiful drawings of mappings across the American landscape. And I suppose I always resisted the big wow hero image, or the money shot, as people call it. I hated that. Um, this idea of producing that sort of, you know, big corner angle um, building shot. And I loved these um, collages that, to me, revealed a lot more about design, site, place, and process. Always enjoying buildings that might have worked somewhere between architecture and landscape. And back to Caesar again, but also remembering about kids and play and designing good cities. I had to show something of Kirsten Thompson's. I think we're just so, so lucky to be a woman and to have her as a role model in Melbourne and in Australia. Um, I think she's probably everyone's favourite. She's just so clever, always showing the right amount of restraint. And I also just picked out this project, um, Donovan Hill, an early Donovan Hill project, which I really loved because it's, it sort of somehow sits somewhere between architecture and landscape. But it also, as a sort of private house, it provides private amenity, but also considers its role in the public realm and the public domain. Travel and friends. So, despite there's been so many, it was International Women's Day yesterday, and to me, I'm optimistic. There's just so many sort of fantastic things happening. I've been given so many opportunities. Um, but it is sort of still, I think, a male-dominated um, construction industry for women. And so this is Claire and me. Um, they're my girl gang, Claire Cousins, Amy Muir. It's lovely that they're here tonight supporting me. They've been there all along the way. And we've travelled together a lot. It started with Amy and I on the Julux study tour. Um, we got to go see the Tate Modern under construction, enjoying the brick details on site. Some Bofill, um, you know, brilliance, this sort of industrial ru ruin. And one of my favourites with Amy, Amy took me to see the Aguilada Cemetery. Here's the ladies seeking out some, some botter, and some Carla Scarpa. For me, always the bits that stood out to me were the little landscape moments, and I was always drawn to those little details. Sometimes we let our husbands come too, and it's not always architecture. And our kids have become good travel buddies along the way. Rob and I dragged our two girls um, on a core pilgrimage, like many do seeing the big ones, but also um, mostly enjoying these little moments where the legs might hit the ground. Or these sort of moments of integration with landscape. Or interior colour joy. Big um, city rooms, not always defined by buildings. Urban density, Asian density, and learning how one might really activate a city. I loved this bit of the Barbican with this animated, operable facade. And again, returning back to the landscape. Learning about detailing in Japan, celebrating gutters and drainage some de Klerk brick brilliance in Amsterdam, 
But returning to the red dirt, and acknowledging that we can learn more from country about time, light, and space. Anyway, Studio Bright. This is, it's really kind of, um, for me, quite weird to indulge in a talk that's just about me. This, um, the work that we do is made by a group of very clever people. And the buildings that we make are not some individual endeavour of some genius architect with a pen and a white page. They require many hands, and my feeling is, is that my journey is only one part of the story of the work that we make and produce. There's a whole bunch of people in my studio that help generate the work that we're doing. And really, I think the smartest thing that I've done is gather this group of people together and, and make, a, make a space for them to do their best work. There's a whole bunch of very clever um, architects that work for me. There's, you know, graduates and architects that, to me, are way smarter than I ever was. And I'm also lucky to have my good husband. I convinced him after our second daughter was born to come and um, work in the practice, and his detailing and structural brilliance is embedded in every project. The hardest thing is to keep him away from building boats, which I think is his true passion. You've seen them a few times now, wondering why she got them in there. Anyway, I'm just going to talk to the slides. So really, you know, I think my best design project is um, making, a, making a place um, that supports and nurtures good people. We take studio culture very seriously. Chickens, honey, PT. Lunch, not as a once-off, but every single day. It's my belief that working for me should be good for you. Anyway, so, Furman, it said we're not allowed to talk about our work, but I do have a few slides, but I won't talk about them directly. <laughs> um, so just to finish up, what does all this mean for our work? We hope our work is context-driven and site-responsive and makes a con positive contribution to the neighbourhood and city. Houses with civic ambitions. We think the private house has something to offer the greater city, and that can be an agent of urban design. We think much can be gained from giving some things up, privacy, security, and a little bit of space. Take care of the past. History and context offer so much richness. And most often, the things with the biggest impact are not the biggest things. Seats, for example, the scale of people. We try to make the edges work as hard as we can to allow us to design efficient but generous homes and spaces. We'd like our work to be fruity enough to be delightful, and that it might be joyful and might make you smile. And that we think architecture should be gentle and kind, never shouting to be heard. We think you should know the rules, but know how to work around them. Privacy screens, pool fences, and we think landscape is never an afterthought, and that it's in, as important as the architecture itself, and often doesn't need as much room as you think. We think we try to invest as much effort in the details as the big idea, and try to know our materials well. And we like to always think about the other clients at the table, the city, the street, and the next generation. We think there's no excuse for a building that doesn't respond to climate. Simple things, catch the sun, provide shade, feel the breeze, warm your bones. I can see you, Furman, and I'm almost done. <laughs> Lastly, we hope to design with empathy and kindness and do good things. And I hope that we can save our best design efforts for the people that might need them most. 
Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I should do that for, for you, not you for me. <laughs> I'm just uh, more keen on the water than you are. Um, you have mentioned a few things that uh, were very interesting. Um, I, will, I would like to, hi to highlight, as for example, you mentioned that you feel like the journey of um, your journey is one of many at the office. Um, but it's also difficult to find the right people that also fit to you, with you, right? Um, and how do you... It's, I, I see this is always some, something challenging, that finding people where you... Will, which, because you are going to spend a lot of time together. Uh, hopefully a good time. Or, yeah. yeah. Do you have any... No, I mean, I think that's true. I've been lucky that a lot of my team, uh, the, sort of as we've grown, very few have left, mm -hmm. which is um, hopefully because they like it and we make a nice space. Um, but I, I also sort of think that sometimes you employ people and think they're going to do a particular job and maybe that's not really their skill. Mm. And, but maybe they've got something other to offer. And so yeah. sometimes I feel like my job is to find out what that might be. Mm. And maybe um, m the practice needs to actually mould around that, mm. not be, oh, we do this, and are you good enough to be yeah. part of that to offer? But instead, yeah. it's actually, a, it sort of works both ways. So, you know, my team will directly be involved in which job should we take on, you know? Did you have to think around also with your husband in the team? Or was it a good match from the beginning? No. <laughs> we, we never planned on working together. Um, but he's so clever. And um, he was working as an architect um, in his family practice in McIntyre Partnership. And when we had kids, um, he let me, uh, I suppose, be the priority at work because the practice was just starting to get going. And, um, he, he felt like doing something different, but he was home with the kids, and I thought, this, he's just too good an architect to be um, doing that, though he was having a nice life riding his bike and boat building. So um, we, but we found, again, like, you know, working out how we might work together and what he's good at, um, it's, that's been the sort of trick, and mm. so, you know... Yeah, I, I actually, know. He, was, uh, he was the one who pushed you to uh, start your own business? Yeah, he did a bit. I think I was sort of a little bit like, oh, I don't think I could do that. And so, you know, it's nice that you say that because in many ways, not only does Rob do all of the sort of contribute to the projects, but he has, um, since I've met him, you know, pushed me and encouraged me. And That's when I've cool. said, you know, big projects have come in and I've said, oh, there's no way we can do that. He's like, oh, come on, Mel, you know, get on with it. So that's pretty um, fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. It's very yeah. nice. Um, actually, that's something that, um, that I really appreciate of you, that you started with some small projects. And um, it's something that we often, often see in one of famous architects that here started with, with uh, family or friends who were, which, who were wealthy enough to yeah. get projects and it was a good start. Just, I just want you to know my dad, I don't think, would ever engage me as an architect. It's, not too, <laughs> never, it's, ne it's never too late. I, um, I, saw, the, I saw the house. Yeah, so yeah. No, um, I didn't have um, any um, commission from family or friends. Mm. Um, it was a sort of... Um, actually, Rob gave me the first project. I think I, I, he gave me a bathroom renovation that he didn't want to do. So I said yes. And then I just said yes to the next one and the next one after that. But um, how, how did you keep, uh, I guess, it's not, all, it's not easy, and you mentioned that maybe you have some doubts at some point with big uh, um, possible projects and so on. How did you keep motivated, not only you, but also with the team? Um, because now, okay, the practice is doing well, mm. but it took time. Yeah, well, I didn't really start thinking we would even end up doing anything that anyone would be interested in. Mm. I thought it would be a nice thing to do on the side of, um, you know, other things as well. And I suppose um, it's just been a sort of slightly fluid journey and um, maybe um, just never giving up and still just wanting each building to be as good as we could make it. Mm. So I don't know if that answered your question, but... Um, yeah, it mm. kind of 
developed to to where you are? Yeah, I think it's actually, I feel like it's a bit harder now because you go, oh, we won that award, shit, well, this is standard now, and it's almost yeah. like um, pre you feel exhausting. The pressure? You feel yeah. the pressure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, wait, that would be yeah. also an interesting conversation. And we used to do work that was like, you know, you showed quite a few of our early projects here, and you, at least you sort of knew a little bit it was hidden out in the backyard. And, you know, as the work, we've been, you know, lucky to do a lot more houses on streets, but the work becomes more public, so I sort of think, oh, we better not, we better not mess that up. And are you worried? It's something that, you, that keeps you awake at night, thinking of... <laughs> no, I don't think so. That's good. No, 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 that's um, okay. Well, no, no. The team are great. Everyone's good. That's great. Actually, There's other things to worry about. Okay. <laughs> we don't need to talk about it here. <laughs> <laughs> If it's so personal, you don't need to no, mention no. it. No, no. All right. <laughs> no, it's I think I probably, in truth, I lie awake more worrying about my children than my yeah. buildings. So, you know, I think um, the nice thing about um, making enough mistakes is that... Um, one can be a little bit more calm about the mistakes in architecture and yeah. um, be more forgiving and kind with yourself. So, you know, we've had enough things, you know, we've worked through enough things that you, I can kind of go, it's all right, Mel, we've, you know, we've done this before and we worked mm. out a way around it. The mm. kids is a whole new um, thing that you're sort of launching off into the darkness. Yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about kids maybe with James with four, four kids. That's very yeah, yeah, exciting. James is a miracle worker. How do you do it? Yeah. Um, One last question regarding, um, you mentioned that, uh, you say that in a previous interview that you feel like it's like 1% creativity and 99% trying to make it happen. Yeah. Um, is there for you any kind of a skill that you think an architect should have in order to make it happen? Mm. I mean, I, like, I always use that um, Jay-Z quote, which is the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up because it's sort of, you know, not enough to come up with a good idea. You know, you have to kind of keep through a budget, client, all the mm. things, um, be um, determined and um, tenacious. Mm. So uh, hopefully we're doing that and not giving up. That's true. Mm. Thank you, Mel, for the Thank nice you. presentation. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see each other with you in the roundtable yeah. discussion. Thank you, Mel. Thank you a lot.